Good morning, friends. I hope that wherever you are today, you're cultivating a heart of worship. And so as we come with our hearts prepared for worship, I want to invite you uh, to be listening carefully for what God has for you. We believe that love lives here, not just in this physical space here at St. Mark, but within our hearts, so that everywhere that we are, God is there too. I want to thank you for being a generous church. I want to thank you for being great leaders in your household and in this community. And as we gather together as a people, we are called to be disciple makers of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. So friends, welcome to worship. I will sing with the voice that he's placed in my soul so the world will hear what he has done. We must sing if our hearts have been changed by our God. Let the whole world know that he has come. Come and sing with the angels to the King. Come and bring him your song. Come As we begin a time of prayer, wherever you are today, I want to invite you to turn your palms upward if that's possible for you right now. This is a small way for us to embody in our flesh the posture of our hearts toward God in prayer, one of openness, of receptivity for all that God has. So will you join me in prayer? Gracious and loving God, we are delighted that you sit enthroned over all creation. We have a grand vision painted for us in the Psalms, in the Prophets, in the final book of our scriptures in Revelation, one where you are completely in charge. Oftentimes it's easy to forget that. It's easy to think that this world is spinning off of its axis and that our individual lives are in a complete disarray. It's easy to look around and see where nations are at war with other nations and to forget that you, O Prince of Peace, are the master at pulling even the worst things together and making them somehow bring glory to you. It's, it's hard to imagine that right now. But we cling to the scriptures, we cling 
ultimately to you who has breathed life into those scriptures and we ask that you will breathe life into our lungs once again that you'll enable us to sing a song that is both melodious it's grand and it's able to bring honor to you thank you that you stooped to us that that we have never had to climb our way up to you but only through your grace you have wrapped your arms around us you've washed away our sin and you are making us more into the image that you have for us. So we yield to you today everything that we have, and we ask that you will transform us more and more into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. We are uh, standing here and sitting here wherever we find ourselves today in prayer and brokenheartedness with all who have family members who have died, who are ill, or those who are in need of healing in mind, body, or spirit. Where one part of the body aches, all ache. We also come with joy and celebration because we know that you are alive and that you are at work in our community and you are opening the eyes of the blind and that you are enabling uh, people who are on the fringes to be able for, to have their voices heard. And so we ask for a complete restoration of this world that you have. We long for it to begin in our own lives and to emanate into all corners of your creation. This is our prayer in the strong name of Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. And those who agreed, said and typed together, Amen. Friends, I want to thank you for your generosity, for making it possible for us to be partnering with our community to transform lives. If you've not yet jumped over to our website and partnered with us financially, we invite you to do that. And we offer not just our finances, but our whole lives for the glory of God. see you this morning I'm so sorry that you're not here with me but one day soon we'll be together I promise and I cannot wait for that day today we're gonna to talk about joy what does the word joy mean that's right joy means when you're so happy you can't even contain yourself you are so joyful you're excited you are loving something you are happy it's the most happy you can be is when you have joy well God tells us that we should always have joy in our hearts that we should be filled with joy because we love God and God loves us and that joy should always be in our hearts so today we're gonna make a joyful noise how many of you know what a joyful noise is that's right, when you're so excited and you can't help it and you scream and yell and you're happy and you get instruments and you shake them. So today, what I want you to do is when I count to three, I want you to say, I love God. And I want you to say it with so much joy in your heart. Okay? And I'm going to shake my musical instruments. All right, here we go. One, two, three. I love God. Very good. That's what God tells us to do, is to always have a joyful heart and always be joyful when God, when we're thinking about God, whenever we want to pray to God, we should always have joy or happiness in our heart. I love you guys and I hope you find lots of joy in your week this week. I miss you and I'll see you soon. Mwah! Bye! Psalm 98. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. 
His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him victory. The Lord has made known his victory. He has revealed his vindication in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody. With trumpets and the sound of the horn, make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and all those who live in it. Let the floods clap their hands, let the hills sing together, for joy at the presence of the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, friends. Uh, I'm really grateful for Rebecca reading our scripture for us this morning. I hope you're enjoying this series on the Psalms. I've really enjoyed teaching through it, and not only just in the time that we have together, but in my preparation throughout the weeks, uh, it has been really encouraging for me and uplifting. And a good reminder of what we've been covering over the last couple of weeks would be simply that the Psalms function as a reminder and a vehicle for us to place ourselves under the reign of God how to place ourselves under the reign of God. And one of the key ways to do that is for us to be trained in the art of prayer and for us to be cultivating lives full of prayer. And and if you're curious and you'd like to go back over the last couple of weeks, take a look at our video archive right below you. And uh, we'd love to have you uh, engage those videos to learn more about what we've been covering. Uh, This morning we're going to dive into Psalm 98. It is a a psalm that is often called uh, an enthronement psalm where we look at God placed on the throne of all creation, and it's one that's celebratory. Now, I know it's kind of odd to think about uh, this being a jubilant and joyful time. There's a lot of heavy things in the news, a lot of heavy things in the life of our church, uh, but we come as a people who can enter into any environment with the joy of Christ in our hearts. Um, who, who more than anybody else can do this than Music Ruth? I think about her, and as we gather today to film this, we're actually in the choir room. Now, if you've ever spent any time in the choir room, I want you to jump into the comments right now and just let us know what it means to you to be able to sing. Now, I know that we're not able to sing in corporate environments yet um, because of safety concerns, but we hope and pray that wherever you find yourself, that you will be singing and you'll be lifting up your voice to God. And so my primary question for you this morning is simply this. What song is your life singing? What song is your life singing? Maybe as you spend a little time reflecting on that today, it feels like a dirge. It feels dark. It feels like there's a lot of minor chords. There's a lot of brokenness in the song that you're singing. Uh, Is the song that you bring today one that is, on the other hand, joyful? It's celebratory. You're praising God for the good things that God has done, that God is doing, and God will do in the future. Is your song one that lifts up other people as you engage them? Or is your song one that brings other people down? These are careful things for our consideration. So what song is your life singing today? As we begin to uh, figure out what song we are singing, what we have as a reminder today is the reminder that we get to choose what song we sing. The song that's given to us is not always one uh, that's outside of our purview, outside of our control, but it's one that we get to choose. So I want to offer you Psalm 98 as a model for how it is that our lives can sing in the midst of any environment. Let's just jump right in. Psalm 98. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord a new song. Why? For He has done marvelous things. Now, over the last several weeks as we've been quarantined with my four children and with Joanna, one of the things I've noticed is that our kids love to sing. Our twins, they can't quite sing yet, but our girls will walk around the house with the song in their hearts at all times. Usually it's something from Frozen. Other times it's songs that they've heard and learned right here at St. Mark. 
Other times, they're just making up songs on their own. It'll be about anything that they're doing. And as a young parent, Joanna and I, we will see these girls going around the house or out in the yard and singing. And what makes a parent's heart more proud than to see their kids singing and praising God? Now, there are certain times where it's bedtime. We're not going to go there. Jumping right in. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him victory. This is the first time that word victory shows up, and it shows up three times in this first stanza. He has revealed his vindication in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love. That's that beautiful Hebrew word, has said his steadfast love and faithfulness. Aspects of God's personality that are at the very core of who God is. And it's not just a steadfast love and a faithfulness in a vague sort of way. But where? To the house of Israel. Now, this is really important for us as Christians in particular, because what we have to remember is that we are the humble guests of a different story. We have been invited into God's salvation, yes, of the whole world, but it's a story and a covenant relationship that began with the people of Israel. So as we enter into any theological work, any kind of work where theology and politics start to line up, or even the way that we treat one another, we have to remember that we don't have the corner market on this. In fact, we come as humble guests in the house of another. All the ends of the earth have seen the victory of God has seen the victory of God. Uh, this, these phrases are just so profound and beautiful. Why? Because all of this emerges from a, partif- uh, a particular context that we know in our scriptures as the Exodus. Now, this is the story where Israel was redeemed from Egyptian captivity. We get the idea of Passover and God's liberating arm. This language of he's done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him victory. This kind of language is very consistent with the songs that are sung around Exodus as the people are being lifted out. So this psalmist in Psalm 98 is putting together a piece of historical praise. He's looking backward to the things that God has done, the liberative work that God has done, and it brings joy, it brings jubilance into the life of this individual person. And what does it do? It invites this person to sing. It invites this person to sing. Now, this is the first stanza. Let's take a second look here, at the, an, another look at the second stanza. stanza. Uh, not only is this an invitation to an individual to sing to the Lord a new song, but it make joyful noise, noise to the Lord who? All the earth. Now, yes, this is talking about the globe, but in particular, this word is talking about the people groups. This is talking about individual um, cultures that have been drawn together who are able to collectively praise God for the good things that God has done. What does he, the psalmist do? Invites them to break forth into joyous song and to sing praises. Sing praise to the Lord with all of these ancient instruments. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with a lyre. I'm not too familiar with it. But sing praise to the Lord with the lyre and with the sound of melody, with trumpets, the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Now, all of this is pointing us to the fact that we need to use our best gifts to offer unto God. Yes, maybe some of you play the piano and you've spent time in here. Others of you have learned guitar, and I'm thankful for Cole and other people who have spent time teaching others how to play instruments. I'm thankful for Dan Cater, who teaches our students to sing so beautifully for Godspeed and the choir that we have for our students. And uh, we just celebrated lots of our students who are our seniors who graduated just this week. Um, As we look at this, we're not just using our instruments, but we're using our entire being as instruments unto God. Now, all of these people groups offer everything that they have for the glory of God. And as they do, it begins to emanate outward so that other people groups begin to know and to learn about the identity of who God is. The loving, faithful, steadfast one who reaches into every aspect of creation where people are in despair, people are despondent, and reaches into those oppressed people groups and offers freedom and release. 
I'm going fast, but I want to move to our final piece. Because this that began in stanza one as an individual praise, it moves to a call to corporate praise and ultimately invites all creation to join in the singing of God's redemptive work. Take a look. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. And all that fills it. Yes, this is talking about the great blue whales. This is talking about the fish of the sea. But it's also talking about more than that. All the waters themselves. All the molecules. Inviting every piece of creation to praise God. The world and those who live in it. Again, all people groups. This language gets so poetic and beautiful. Look at this. Let the floods clap their hands. <laughs> Let the hills sing together for joy at the presence of the Lord. Why? For He's coming to judge the earth. He'll judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. This is beautiful language in and of itself. But when we begin to understand a little bit of the context, it becomes even more beautiful. Why is that? Because in ancient Babylonian culture, there were creation myths. Uh, there were understandings of the ancient world where these elements were not elements that were celebratory and almost uh, comical in the way that they're portrayed here. Not comical in a bad sense, but look at this. I mean, who would imagine a flood clapping its hands? Who would imagine hills singing together in perfect harmony, says Eugene Peterson in his translation of this song called The Message? No, these symbols of a sea roaring, uh, of a flood, of hills, all of these things would have been symbols of fear in the ancient world, especially the sea that's roaring in the floods. In agrarian economies where your whole life is based on your crops, a flood is a threat to your very existence. And what does the psalmist do? It says that even these floods, no longer are they going to come in for destruction with arms and talons to rip apart cultures, but they come in and they clap their hands. Even the things that were meant for evil, even the things that looked like they were fearful and un unknown, even when you think about all the things that fill the sea, can you imagine the myths of sea monsters who were beneath the ocean? All of these things are, that were once evil or thought to be are now being redeemed by God, being brought into its completion and being used as an element of praise. Oh man, if this doesn't get you excited, friends, you might even want to check yourself. All right, let me, let me show you how our poets and our songwriters in the United Methodist Hymnal have put this really beautifully. One of my favorite hymns, and every time I sit down at the piano and start to hack away, this is the first hymn that comes to mind for me. And it's meaningful on lots of levels for me. But just listen to the way that this Psalm 98 starts to interface with this particular hymn. It's hymn 144. You've heard it before. This is my Father's world. Don't get nervous. I'm not going to sing it, okay? Uh, listen to these lyrics. This is my Father's world, and to my listening ears... All nature sings, this third stanza, and around me rings the music of the spheres. This is my Father's world. I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas. His hand the wonders wrought. Verse 2, this is my Father's world. The birds their carols raise. The morning light, the lily white, declare their Maker's praise. This is my Father's world. He shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass I hear Him pass. He speaks to me everywhere. This is my Father's world. Verse 3, Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my Father's world. Why should my heart be sad? The Lord is King, let the heavens ring. God reigns, let the earth be glad. You see the parallels here to Psalm 98? Oh, it's such beautiful language. And as I was thinking about how these work together, my, my mind works in images. So I wanted to break it down for you. If you haven't gotten it quite yet, here's how I see these stanzas working graphically. All right, so stanza one is, a, is an invitation for an individual praise. It begins with me. It begins with the song that we are singing. I want to remind you of that initial question, what song is your life singing today? 
And as we begin to connect with God, who is the ruler yet, who is sit enthroned over all the house of Israel and over all of creation through the salvation brought through Jesus Christ, that song begins to emanate from our hearts. It, it begins in a melody and it begins to go into all the nations. I've put seven people groups here in the number of perfect completion and it's no longer the me, but it moves outward to the we. And so as we as a church, as we as a city right here in Birmingham, as a state of Alabama, the United States and around the globe, as we begin to emanate and to sing forth even more fully the song that God has put into our hearts, the song of God being king of the universe, all nations around the globe begin to see the work that God has done and begin to change their lives. And once all those people groups around the globe, this is where it almost is a stretch of the imagination. But friends, you got to go with me here. It's because from there, Psalm 98 points us to all people when they are singing God's song and when they are joined in harmony, all creation... All creation, even the world that we inhabit, begins to more fully embody the practical nature of God. It begins to embody all that it was created to be from the very beginning. All the things that we have broken through our sinful decisions, all the things that we have destroyed through our selfishness and through our greed and through corporate efforts and strife, all of these things begin to be healed. And the God of creation begins to show off once more how everything declares the wonders of God. Now, I want to close with this because you heard in that song, that song from uh, that hymn just a moment ago, um, there is a line that says the music of the spheres. Now, some of you math people will remember the Pythagorean theorem. The person who put that together was a man named Pythagoras. And it's not often known, but he was a little bit of a theologian himself. And as he put together theories, not just of math and of music and the vibrations that take place to put all this together, he began to expound that philosophically and theologically. And what he would claim is that even the, the voice that we use, even the sounds that we make with our, with our voices, the songs that we sing with our lives, those begin to start to sing in harmony with the very molecules of creation itself. And his thought was when everything gets put to rights, yes, by God working in and through the church and through all creation, the earth and all creation begin to vibrate in perfect harmony, being drawn together in the very life of God. So friends, I don't want, I don't want to overstate this. We can't overstate this. That the song that we sing with our life, as we look to the God who created the world and redeemed it in love, we are quite literally changing the world. What song is your life singing? May it be a song of praise to your Redeemer that we know in Jesus Christ.
throne Power sings a siren tune We've been throwing heavy stones Lead us back to life in you oh, 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 oh. Here a valley of dry bones Lead us back to life in you You've become a talent show Lead us back to life in you You've been through